us off here. Uh, welcome to Liquid Margins episode 40, Leveraging Social Annotation to Enhance Open Education Resources. We're really here to talk about OER and open pedagogy, um, and I'm very excited to do so. Um, before we get started, though, a few housekeeping notes. My slides will advance forward. Um, we have some upcoming episodes of Liquid Margins, if you're a fan uh, or you're becoming a fan. Um, on June 8th, we'll be talking about hypothesis on campus at scale. That's going to be a conversation with our campus leads, the folks who run hypothesis on the campus side, to share their perspective about implementing and rolling out and scaling hypothesis usage at their institutions. So especially if you're in an administrative position at your institution and helping uh, instructors get active with hypothesis and, and deepen their engagement. This will be a great episode for you. And then we'll have an, on June 28th, an episode on social annotation in STEM. Uh, and we've got a great pan, a group of panelists from chemistry and biology and computer science and math to talk about that use case, which will hopefully balance today, because although I sent the invitation widely uh, and I'm an English professor by training myself, the two folks that came through for me today as panelists are also English professors. So we are a little heavy on the English and the humanities today, which is fine by me. And I think um, a lot of the conversation won't be disciplinary focused. But uh, if you're a STEM educator and wanting for more STEM specific stuff, tune in on uh, June 28th. Um, this is not a presentation around how to use hypothesis. So if you're here, like, what is hypothesis? I need to understand how it works and uh, how to get started in my class. This is not exactly what this is about. This is a really more broad or deeper conversation about the pedagogical aspects of using social annotation today, focused on OER and open education practices. Um, we do have other resources for that kind of getting started stuff. So you can reach out to Education at Hypothesis for a demo. And there's also some videos on our YouTube channel. Um, finally, uh, if you have a question, we have disabled the chat because there's a lot of folks here. But we do have a Q&A uh, turned on, and we have some of our customer success managers uh, monitoring the Q&A. So if you have questions, you can click on that Q&A button and ask a question. I also do want to note that I'm suspicious, or I, I suspect, rather, that we have some OER experts in the audience. Um, and so if you are an OER user and a hypothesis user, and at some point you're interested in actually speaking your part, um, we'll have an opportunity to take you off a of mute or to promote you to panelists. Don't worry, it's you know, you know, uh, it's not scary to be promoted to panelists. It's gonna be brief, um, but we can invite others to the conversation later on. Um, but the Q&A is there throughout. And then let's see, is that the end of my housekeeping stuff? Oh, closed captioning to see closed captioning, enable it um, via the, the closed captioning icon in the Zoom menu. Um, all right, I wanna just say a few words at the beginning here just about OER and open education practices before we introduce I introduce our panelists. Um, Hypothesis has long been a fellow traveler with the open education resource or OER movement since we started working in education. Uh, the OER movement is founded on the principle that to make education more accessible, we need to openly license educational materials that they should not be proprietary. And similarly, Hypothesis was founded on the principle that a technology like social annotation should also be as widely accessible as possible. Uh, and so our code has been openly licensed or open source uh, from the start. Um, we also have successfully advocated in making web annotation an open standard so that it would be easy to build on and integrate with other platforms and tools. Uh, and similarly, OER is easy to build on, adapt and extend uh, for diverse uh, educational contexts. And then finally, the OER movement has moved, has moved I think beyond just licensing um, and into ad other aspects of advocating for open. Open pedagogy, which I hope we'll talk a little bit about today, has emerged as a practice that just as OER decenters traditional notions of authorship and authority, open pedagogy decenters authority in the classroom, positioning the student as a scholar and a contributor to knowledge production. Hypothesis and social annotation have long been mentioned in discussions of open education and open pedagogy as one of the means to empower student agency and privilege student voice. So with that, I'm thrilled today to be talking about OER and open education more broadly um, with a couple of hypotheses and OER users. Uh, so without further preamble, I'll go ahead and introduce them. So today we have with us Susan Dara Wright, Adjunct Professor of Writing Studies at Montclair State University. Welcome, Susan. And Bridget O'Rourke, uh, Director of the Writing Program and Professor of English at Elmhurst University. And I 
don't know if I introduced myself, but I'm Dr. Jeremy Dean, Vice President of Education at Hypothesis. I do also happen to be an English professor by training. Again, we didn't intend this bias, and we will try to be um, uh, agnostic in our disciplinary uh, conversation to some extent here today, although I'm actually fascinated to hear about <laughs> your writing programs at both these schools, um, and we are an open education practice. But um, let's go ahead and get started with the conversation here um, and start talking initially about open education resources. And this is a chance, I think, for you guys, in addition to this question, also to say uh, who you are and what kind of institution you're at. Um, I think it's helpful. You guys are from different types of institutions in different parts of the, of the US. Um, so feel free to add a little bit of uh, background context here. But I'm curious in general about you know, what motivated you to use OER in your courses. And maybe we can start with you, Susan. Hi. Um, as you said, my name is Sue Wright. I work at Montclair State University in New Jersey. We are a very, very, very large public university that is located really in a big urban hub of New Jersey. Um, we're about 20 minutes outside of New York City, and we're right in the intersection of Patterson, Passaic, Newark, Jersey City, those are our big catchment areas for our students. We do have a large showing also from across the country. We have um, quite a few students who are from out of state, but we are a, basically a commuter college. Um, with that said, we do have a large urban population. We have a large co-requisite population in our course. So we have students who come in at many different foundational levels. We have students who come from very affluent communities like Upper Saddle River. Um, and we have students who come from Patterson to say Newark, Jersey City, Camden, to name just a few. Uh, our classes are very well mixed. We do not have a remedial program per se. We are an exclusively co-requisite class. So we do have students of different economic backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, different ethnic, different um, linguistic backgrounds. So our classrooms really need to accommodate all of those as well as student individual needs. So for us at Montclair State, that's really what drove us towards OER. My experience with OER goes a little further back than that as an individual instructor. I came to OER probably about um, seven or eight years ago. And I was looking for a way to accommodate really my students' needs in my classroom. I wanted a textbook that I could make my own, and I wanted a textbook that could reflect my students. Because at the time, textbooks were still very, I wanna use the word parochial. They still represented what students were coming out of high school seeing, which were very traditional voices. There were people with very traditional backgrounds that didn't reflect my students. And to be honest, we're very expensive. For a lit anthology that even 10 years ago was costing my students maybe $50, today that same textbook, we're talking about 80, I would only be using about a quarter of that textbook. And a fair percentage of that was outside of copyright. So I was, my students were paying for copyright free material as if it was copyrighted. And I investigated alternatives, things that I could bring topics my students were interested in. And that led me to OERs, which at the time were very graciously shared with the academic community by schools who had created books specifically for their programs. There was a great textbook out of the University of Hawaii, which I went to and used for portions of my class where we talked about the environment. But it had the requirements and it had the pedagogical aspects and it had the community for Hawaii represented in the textbook. So it didn't represent my students in New Jersey. Then I would go and find another textbook which had a wonderful section on um, how to use quotes and how to use sources. 
but that had been kind of fine-tuned to be used. I think that one came from the University of Texas and it had their syllabus and their requirements and their rubrics. Um, so over time, happily, OERs have become much more mainstream and there are companies out there um, that are nonprofits that are offering textbooks that are OER that are available for me to go in and fine tune, to add my rubrics, to add my student writings that stand out that I wanna use for activities in my classroom. So my motivation came from my desire to see my students represented in my textbooks, to acknowledge them and in all honesty, to acknowledge their economic disenfranchisement and say, you're not, saying something that's not real. This is a reality and show my students that they're not alone and their desire to move forward in the face of some of these disadvantages and to move forward in the face of saying that there is a community there, both within our university and institution and within the academy itself to support them as they move forward. Just lovely. Uh... Your, your students are lucky, <laughs> in short. Um, that's amazing. Bridget, tell us a little bit about your story of coming to OER. Well, uh, I would echo a lot of the things that Susan has just said. Um, we're, a, we're a very different kind of institution. We're a, a Elmhurst University is a small private uh, uh, university in the liberal arts tradition. We're about 20 minutes west of Chicago in the western suburbs. Um, we are... Uh, an increasingly diverse campus. Uh, we just celebrated our 150th anniversary as an institution. We started as uh, a, a college for uh, a seminary, really a pro-seminary for uh, German evangelical men. And uh, it, it, we've sort of, we use the metaphor of the ever widening circle uh, of a more inclusive and accessible uh, university in the 21st century. So. Um, we are, we have recently been named uh, a Hispanic serving, recognized as a Hispanic serving institution and received a federal grant to support equity and inclusion, particularly for our Hispanic students. Um, the, the motivation really uh, for, for adopting OER in the first year writing program has come from several factors that converged in a really fortunate way uh, for, for the faculty in our program. One is that um, we had the institution uh, offered $500 OER grants to faculty who were adopting OER who had used paid textbooks. And this was a great opportunity for us, especially for adjunct faculty to uh, adopt OER because there are sort of hidden costs with adopting OER, especially creating it, but even just adopting pre, you know, existing OER takes time to find materials and to uh, adapt the curriculum. Um, and so the, those $500 grants were, uh, were really made the uh, OER more accessible for uh, adjunct faculty in a multi-section course like first year composition at Elmhurst. So we had seven faculty this year who have adopted uh, OER in multiple sections of first year composition in the fall term. Uh, last fall, we saved students over $12,000 uh, in the first year writing program. So um, the, of course, the cost is a big issue and faculty in our writing program had noticed that students really they, they didn't, they weren't buying the textbook. Sometimes we find out in the middle of the semester that they hadn't bought the textbook um, and were, uh, were just falling behind on assignments because they didn't have the required materials. So that was part of it. As we've kind of gotten into OER, we found that there's different issues with accessibility. Um, and those have to do with the same accessibility issues that we saw during COVID, you know, lack of access to technology, lack of access to high-speed internet. Um, and so those, are, and even, um, you know, kind of universal design issues making uh, tech, making resources available to all learners, uh, learners with disabilities, um, 
included. So, so OER is uh, makes text more accessible generally in terms of cost and also in terms of technology like text text to speech type um, technology that that uh, makes um, these uh, these um, materials more accessible to uh, to all learners. So. Um, Cost is a big factor, flexibility. Um, the idea that we can uh, adopt uh, and adapt culturally responsive pedagogy um, through more texts that are better targeted to our uh, student body, uh, all these things make, uh, make hypothesis very, or make OER and hypothesis together, which is how we've been using it, very attractive. And then the $500 grants made it like kind of even more accessible for our faculty as well. That's great, Bridget. I, I love your point about the technology accessibility, right? I mean, um, there's the content that can be locked in and proprietary in a textbook, but especially as things are getting delivered in digital platforms, you're also locked into that platform and what tools are available there. And you can't bring your own note-taking tool and maybe they have a note-taking tool or maybe they don't. And so that aspect of a broader, you know, technological accessibility, super interesting, especially when we think about hypothesis. Um, so I think you guys have touched on this a little bit, but let's, let's just uh, focus on this question. And I, my, I'm curious in terms of like, how is teaching with OER different from teaching with a proprietary text. And I'll just be play the cynical devil's advocate here. And, you know, before before we came on uh, recording, uh, Sue, you were sharing like, you know, here's my uh, OpenStax book, right? And it's it's a textbook, right? I mean, how is it different from Bedford St. Martin's or how is teaching with it different in your in your experience? And um, yeah, let's just keep going in the same order this time around, Sue. Um, I think the major difference between OERs and traditional print textbooks, even if an OER like the OpenStax students can purchase, because I do have some students who prefer, myself included, a paper textbook. They prefer something that they can get their hands on, that they're not dependent on high-speed internet, that they're not dependent on having to read. Let's be honest, our students do everything on their telephone. Um, they don't have to read a textbook on a telephone that's, for all intents and purposes, a glorified three by five index card. Um, so uh, having the opportunity to have something that was print on demand, that is the most current update for basically cost, that I can get a textbook that if Bedford St. Martin, for instance, printed it would be 80 or $90, my students can get it for 20. So there is a significant cost differential. However, even if that is something that is still too steep or something a student's not interested in, our students live in an all digital world. They're happy reading on a telephone. I'm a little older, I'm not. So they can get this immediate right on their phones, have it right there. So there is an immediacy factor, and there is, for me, the best benefit of an OER is I can get right into the nuts and bolts of the text. I can open up and say, you know what, I don't find the presentation of this reading to be the way I like it. I can go in, snip it out, and I can say, you know what, this reading from a student who talked about um, learning to cook with their grandmother in the Dominican Republic and what it was like to use, you know, I teach a, a course that's on food writing. And this one student from the Dominican Republic talked about using goat meat and how even when her grandmother comes here, the meat, even if she buys goat, isn't the same. That to me is a big nod to student ownership of text and to student ownership of the course. It presents and allows students to say, I may not be Dominican, but you know what? When I buy plantains here, they don't taste like when I'm home. When I buy um, a specific meal, it doesn't taste the same here because of. So I can snip out that standard kind of sanitized reading that comes in textbooks and include a student voice. And when we talk about a paper, I'm talking about a student voice. I can say, you know, especially with the student I know, why did this student make this choice? 
If you were making this same choice in a draft, what would you be thinking? And I knew the student. So I can allow that student to come into the class. Or, and as I've done with programs like um, Padlet or Flipgrid, I've actually had students create a little introduction to their, vid to their paper. And I've dropped a video right in and said, okay, guys, watch this student from last semester talk about their paper. And they see a face, they hear a voice. There's an added authenticity. And for me, the struggle of adapting an OER is worth it because it's authentic. And I think I'm just gonna turn it over to you, Bridget, because I don't wanna belabor a point. Yes, thank you. I mean, the, the idea of authenticity, I think, was uh, when we did a survey of our students who were uh, in sections using OER, there was this sense of that these materials in OER, the students were aware um, that these materials were curated by faculty for specifically for this course. So it's almost like having a custom uh, a custom textbook in a way. Um, the, the faculty in our program generally don't use like a single OER text, um, a, a textbook. We use a lot of different OER materials. Um, that does support, and I would uh, again affirm what, uh, what Susan was saying, that, uh, that, it, that it supports culturally responsive pedagogy. This was really apparent to me last fall when uh, we uh, read uh, Gloria and Ledua's How to Tame a Wild Tongue. And the, when we uh, talked about the use of Spanish in that text, I was really blown away with the number of students in the class who said, I've never seen Spanish in any assignment I've done in school, uh, anything I've read in school, unless it was a Spanish course. And the other students you know, echoed that comment and I asked them, well, how did you feel when you read that? And they said, proud or surprised or um, affirmed and empowered. I think one that used the word empowered. And it was so, you know, it really just showed me how important this is for students to see their own experience reflected in the text that we use in first year writing. Um, the another difference between, for, for me personally, between using a paid textbook and adopting OER and as program director as well, is that the texts that are uh, um, open educational text that are freely available online are accessible to annotate and hypothesis. And this was, uh, you know, using a paid textbook, even when it was online, if there's a firewall, you can't use hypothesis. And uh, so that was a barrier for faculty um, in using uh, hypothesis and you, adopting OER has removed that barrier. And some of our, you know, adjunct faculty are really, it's really kind of exploded into a lot of creativity uh, in using social annotation in first year writing and encouraging active, visible social reading. Um, so that's a big difference, I think, when with the textbook. It almost seems like the textbook is sort of this very highly individualized, I mean, not individualized in the sense of customized, but this kind of like they access it on their own, you know, and there's really no other way to access it, access it if it's password protected and, you know, we can show it on the screen in class, but there's not a way for students to engage in it like they can with hypothesis. Um, as I said earlier, there's one thing that's uh, different with OER is in some ways OER is more accessible, but then there's other challenges with accessibility, particularly when we're using a lot of different readings and throwing them up on Blackboard. Sometimes students really like to have one text, you know, it's it, it, for accessibility. Some do prefer to have a print text, although what we found in the survey was most students don't, but you know, a significant minority would rather have a print text. So, um, so some of our uh, faculty have, for example, made their, you know, made print out like course packs of OER text. Um, so, so there's different issues with accessibility, but generally, um, especially in combination with hypothesis, we find that students are uh, more likely to uh, to engage uh, with their with their text with texts uh, that are OER. Um, and 
one more thing I would add is that it, it, it enables us to use a lot of more multimodal text and uh, both for reading, viewing, listening, you know, podcasts and YouTube videos and all sorts of media. But um, I think it also kind of go, comes into the open pedagogy issue with encouraging students to compose their own uh, multimodal texts as well, which a lot of our faculty are doing. And OER, I think really having multimodal text to model and demonstrate then uh, help students to be able to, uh, to create their own as well. That's great. Thank I'd you, like Bridget. To just, I'd like to piggyback on that for just one moment. Now, another aspect um, that I have seen that OERs enable is it takes a text from being something students are basically passive consumers of. Students take a text, read it, hypothesis allows them to get into the text and add their comments. We have a shared ownership. But OER also enables you as the instructor, depending on what vehicle you're presenting your OER through, to open a text into a program like um, Word or Google Docs, which is absolutely free. And I have actually gone in and included assignments into the textbook so that the textbook becomes an all-in-one text and workbook. So students don't have to go and say, I need to look up how do I um, brainstorm for a literacy narrative. They don't have to have one textbook open with their literacy narrative, one textbook open that's their handbook, one textbook, one notebook open, or a screen that they do their writing. I've actually gone in and using Google Docs, created a space that says, now that you've read about this, let's try it in action. And students can actually use that as either a common notebook that then they can share within their groups through share settings in Google, or they're able to keep it private and say, hey, Sue, I hit a snag. I don't know where I can take this idea. Could you go in and look at page four and give me feedback? And I can hop right into a student text. I can drop a note that's private between me and the student or share between the student and their group and say, you have a really good idea here, but did you think of asking this question? So I can go in and using an OER, model good critical reading, critical thinking, and critical writing skills that benefit not just the one student, but the class. And students themselves can then say, could we add this into our text? So if a student finds a source, I can go in and say, you know, that's really good. I can't get that in, but I could put a hyperlink here. So it allows the students to not just be consumers of text, but to be creators of text and to understand that their voice has that power to it, that it's not just me saying, yeah, you're right, you have a good point. There's an acknowledgement from me and an acknowledgement from the community we're in that, yes, I really like this, thank you, Jared, for including this, or thank you, Julius, you said it better than I could, which for my uh, co-requisite students, they've never had that from anyone other than the teacher. Bridget, I see you nodding vociferously. Did you want to add to anything? <laughs> or just no, a just amen? <laughs> agreed, you know, that, that I just completely agree with what Susan has just said. Uh, Sue, would you mind just defining really quickly when you when you talk about the co-requisite students, um, can you just define that for the audience real quick and what you mean there? Uh, co-requisite is a classroom where I have students of all level and academic need. I can have a student in my class who was an AP English major in a very highly competitive high school sitting next to a student who was very average in an average high school or a student who came who was superior in an urban school and their needs and developmental what's the word i'm looking for their needs and their academic challenges are not unique and uniform throughout the course so we do a lot of supportive instruction. We offer 
probably about a quarter of our classes now are done in a four credit structure where we have an in-class workshop so that students are not hitting kind of walls of meaning where when I give an assignment and I'll say something like, I need a good strong piece of writing that has a strong narrative voice. To one student, that may be all they need to understand the assignment. But to another student, I will really have to explain in my rubric, in my setup, in my assignment, exactly what that need is. So some students need more scaffolding than others. And we have this all in a mixed classroom. I don't know, Bridget, would you add anything to that? As a program director, I'm an adjunct. So as a program director, you may have, you definitely have much more insight into how those defining terms are maybe cataloged for the institution. Yeah, there are a lot of unique factors in that. Ours is, uh, our program is, uh, first year writing is a prerequisite for our integrated curriculum, AKA gen ed programs. Okay. Well, like a good interview, I feel like you guys have always sort of anticipated my next question. Maybe I shouldn't have shared them ahead of time, but you guys are pushing us forward in a great way. So much appreciated there. So I'm going to skip the next thing in my deck here because I think you guys have touched on that. And I just want to transition to talking about open pedagogy. Um, I think we've actually defined it pretty well and you guys certainly get it. I'm just going to offer a definition real quick for the audience um, of open pedagogy. And this actually comes from the UT Arlington uh, website. Uh, open pedagogy is the practice of engaging with students as creators of information rather than simply consumers of it. Sue's already touched upon that. It's a form of experiential learning in which students demonstrate understanding through the act of creation. As creators of information, students in these courses gain a greater understanding of the rights and responsibilities associated with information ownership. Uh, practitioners of open pedagogy instructors embrace collaboration, student agency, and authentic audiences. Um, and then this is a nice slide for y'all to, to help sort of understand it comes from Rajiv um, and Robin, uh, Rajiv Yanggiani and Robin DeRosa, two longtime uh, hypothesis fans and OER advocates and open education practitioners. Um, so shout out to them. But let's start talking about open pedagogy. I think we already have. Um, and let's dive into the hypothesis of it all specifically. Uh, how do you use hypothesis social orientation with OER? And Bridget, maybe this time we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about how are you using hypothesis in your courses? And I guess your colleagues, since you sort of represent a group. Right. Um, well, a, a, a lot of us are using um, hypothesis uh, for, well, let's see, open pedagogy first. I'm thinking of um, this idea of, of uh, community-centered, learner-driven learning. And I think this is really so important um, in the writing program, especially with first year students, that that level of engagement of centering the students in the classroom is really uh, essential to, uh, to our program and to student success in the program. And I see that a lot in the uh, in student feedback um, on, and so our, we have really exceptional instructors who are really finding ways to meet students where they're at and to uh, engage them uh, in their own learning and reflecting on their own learning. One way I'm thinking of uh, in particular that uh, kind of works well with the open pedagogy and also integrates hypothesis is um, something we call like a, a jigsaw um, approach to analyzing a reading. So actually just one of, just the other day, one of my colleagues was uh, presenting on her use of hypothesis in uh, the first semester composition course where she had students reading, you know, a lot of these students are um, differently prepared from, uh, from previous generations of students. So we, we know that students have changed uh, during the hypothesis, during remote learning. We haven't figured out all the ways things have changed, but we know that they've changed. Um, but one of the ways is a real, I think it's been challenging for students to read complex academic texts and, um, and to read them skillfully. And uh, Liz Stark, uh, one of our faculty uh, presented recently about using, uh, uh, she used a long academic text, about 43 pages 
And it was on the final girl trope in horror movies. The, the special topic in this course is, is horror. And so there's a level of student engagement and they get to choose, for example, what films they watch as a class um, from, a, from a list curated by the faculty member. And when they read this long uh, text that's a foundational text uh, in film criticism about the final girl trope in horror, um, she has them, she breaks them up into groups and assigns each of those groups part of the text so that they really only have to read, annotate and in hypothesis and analyze one section of the text. And then they uh, bring together, they present to the whole group, here's what this, you know, this part of the, uh, of the text is saying, um, and here's where it fits with the rest of the text. So they use, you know, it's a combination of doing online annotation because we use, uh, we teach first year writing in computer labs, all of our first year writing courses are computer and computer labs. They use hypothesis to annotate and understand as a group. And then they put post-it notes on the board or write on the right on the whiteboard, their um, kind of summary of that section. This really helps students a lot, especially they've read their section before class. So then they read and annotate before they come to class and then look at their annotations together to summarize that part of the reading. And what what we hear from students is things like, I, I wasn't sure that I was understanding this until I saw this other student's annotation and then I knew I was on the right track. And, um, you know, so they're learning from and with each other and they're learning to read collaboratively and learning to read socially, um, which I think is something that because of their engagement in social media, they're, they're, they have facility and capacity with that. They just need to figure out, we need to figure out as faculty how to scaffold that capacity into academic writing. And um, Liz Stark uh, does an excellent job of that. Um, they also um, create a lot of, you know, that the annotations themselves then become student created content, um, it, which is really important to uh, to open pedagogy as well. So um, that's just one uh, one way that we're um, we're implementing open pedagogy is through analysis and synthesis of complex readings facilitated by hypothesis um, uh, via Blackboard. And one quick follow up, Bridget, and before we hear from you, Sue, because I think you might uh, take us in this direction as well, is are instructors annotating in your experience within the courses, or is it mostly the students? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think it probably varies, and I'm not sure across the board, but Liz Stark in particular, she responds to their to the students' annotations. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, when I use hypothesis, um, I'll often use, you know, I'll model for them what annotation uh, looks like. Sometimes I'll, uh, often I'll use an annotation to actually post the prompt so that when they're reading, you know, if I'm asking them to, for example, analyze specific rhetorical appeals or something like that, I'll um, post, you know, somewhere up at the top, you know, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to post, you know, having a specific prompt really helps students, I think, um, you know, rather than just read this and annotate it. Um, and then I will show them, you know, here's a, Here's an example of an ethical appeal, and uh, and then I sometimes will show them, you know, how to tag um, a, a particular section as well. So um, that's a really good question because I generally don't annotate alongside the students, but I think that would be a way to kind of equalize that, you know, the students as the students and teachers as co-creators of knowledge. And I think this is really, you know, it, it is important to the open pedagogy that what students find when they're analyzing these complex texts is that they can read them, they can understand them, that they're creating knowledge together about what this really difficult, challenging text means. And to have the instructor sort of being that guide on the side, but also engaged in that same process as well, as opposed to just kind of standing above it, like, I know what this means, now you figure it out, um, then makes it, you know, then they would get to see more of the instructor, you know, themselves, in, you know, struggling, you know, with what does this mean? You know, what does, 
you know, the, sometimes it's ambiguous what, it, yep. you know, and, and scholarship can be really dense and uh, impenetrable. So to see that instructors struggle too, or instructors ask questions um, too about the text or engage in that dialogue with the text, I think would be a good example. And one last question before I kick it to you, Sue, just because this one came up in, or I think this relates to something that came up in the Q&A, but um, are folks, are instructors grading student annotations, uh, or are you, Bridget, um, is it part of the grade uh, workflow to do formative assessment on the annotations? We don't generally grade them, but we do, often instructors will assign some kind of credit. So it could be, sometimes I just assign yeah. one point and it's essentially a completion, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's great, and because Thomas asked in the Q and A that he's had less luck with students annotating, but certainly if you make it an assignment that's required, um, that does kind of put it more into the to the required workflow for the course. All right, Sue, tell us a little bit about how you use uh, hypothesis social annotation with OER in your courses. Well, of course, a lot of um, what I do or Bridget's already covered because the I think the one of the strongest things that social annotation with OERs offers is a community learning space. I sometimes will use a document where I'll post a piece of student piece of writing and we'll do like a group think, we'll do a brainstorm, we'll get into a Word document um, that I've moved over into hypothesis and we'll mock up a peer review. And there are other times where I'll post something that as um, Bridget was saying is a rather lengthy or dense text, and I'll seed that text with some questions. Or I will look and go, I know this is a word nobody knows. And if four students in my class knows this word or understands this term or is willing to look this term up on their own, um, I'll be surprised. So I will go in and I'll provide a link. I'll go out and find a YouTube video and say, you know, something that if we're reading and it's Dorita comes up and I go, okay, well, no one is going to have any clue what that means, but you kind of understand the diff, you know what that is, or I'll put a Wikipedia entry link in so students can easily and quickly find and practice that kind of research that we will ask of them later on in the semester. But especially in the beginning of the semester, I I think my use of social annotation kind of mutates and morphs and grows. I kind of think of it in three stages. During the beginning of the semester, I use it to be a community builder. I want students to come together and see that we are all, myself included, we're on a journey in this class. And as Everybody who teaches knows every class, even if you're teaching the same syllabus with the same books, with the same readings, every class is going to take it in their own unique way based on the composition inside that classroom. And I think if we don't acknowledge that to students, there's an automatic barrier between our course and our students and ourselves and our students. So in the beginning, I explained to them the hypothesis is kind of like our social media classroom. This is where you can come to be you. And I love that hypothesis allows students to bring YouTube videos in, allows them to speak with emojis, allows them to use the language they use when they speak to each other. And then I can, during the middle part of the semester, start to say, okay, well, now that we're used to communicating these ideas, how can we begin to reflect the language that an assignment would look for? Or since I'm a first year writing instructor, your business instructor or your philosophy instructor is going to be looking for. How can we move from what we socially use into a more academic prose? Because a lot of people look at social annotation, they see the word social and go, this is like social media. I can speak in pictures, I don't have to use my words. I can throw a meme up and that says everything. And I don't think that's fair to the text, to the students or to social annotation to not build off that and say, 
now that we're inhabiting this intellectual space, how can we leverage it and make use of it? So now I can say, have you noticed how I add annotations about what does a term mean? How can you apply this concept to another class? I've been seeding and asking you questions. What have you garnered from those questions? And students now can start taking credit for the learning they didn't realize they were doing. Because learning is something <laughs> students want to see on a test. They want to see, I got 100. They're trained in this from high school. They're trained in this and they're told it's their SAT scores or their GRE scores that define them. And in, at the university level, we're starting to move away from that. And students aren't following us on that trend of academic and intellectual liberation. So in the middle part of the semester, I kind of ramp that up a little bit. When we get to the end of the semester, now I start to ask them, I'm gonna pull back from the text. I'm not seeding this. Who wants to volunteer to be a discussion leader? Wow. And I'll give them access to the text in the beginning. I'll say, you guys read it. Here's, this is a group presentation. You read it, you seed it, you be me. You know what I've done, do it. And then they run the show. And I actually come in and play student. And I actually will come in. I use our school mascot of Rocky the Red Hawk. And I actually pretend to be a student. And they know I will play devil's <laughs> advocate. I will go in and be the most annoying student that I've ever had. And I will go, I don't get it. What do you mean by that? And they know what I'm doing, but they're used to, and they're prepared for this idea of academic give and take of argument and counter argument. And how do you respond to people so that you put yourself in your best academic foot? Because the objective, <clears throat> excuse me, for me is that self-determination. I want them to be autonomous thinkers. I want them to go out and see that their choice, their decision is not just about making the teacher happy, placating the teacher to get the grade. It's about discovering something they didn't know, that they're competent. Because for my students, they come from school districts where, for instance, Patterson has been run by the state of New Jersey because that school system needs oversight. They don't feel that they can compete. I know they can, but how do they know and have the confidence for this? How can they take what they learn in course A and relate it to course B? So I may choose a reading for my food class that is about environmentalism. And how can you, as a three groups from the biology major, make this about your major and then teach that to me. Because for me, that's what social annotation is. It's directly responsive to that course, to those students, so that they see themselves in there, not just as application, but as an honest co-author of meaning. I just need to pause for a second. <laughs> that was such a great... <laughs> Uh, Did I go too fast on that? No, because I get excited I, I sometimes. I'm doing the thing where you know there's an amazing performance and an audience doesn't like is there some kind of majestic moment and they don't they like don't applaud immediately. So yeah, that was incredible. Uh, uh, so really inspiring. Um, I just think it, one of the really neat and powerful things about OER is you can start talking about licensing <laughs> and proprietary content, and you can you get to this place where you start talking about self-determination for students and students as scholars. And that's just one of the really amazing things about the OER movement is that, you know, it kind of can be boring and kind of about licensing, but then, and not that that's boring, sorry, copyright lawyers, um, but it's not as exciting as uh, this idea of just students being empowered, but it really does start with that, uh, that licensing piece that frees the text, that frees the students, that frees the teacher for all this kind of activity. Um, Amazing. Uh, there is a question from the audience from Colleen Sweet about, and I want to pull this into a broader uh, point. Um, so you had talked about, uh, I think, building a community of collaboration, a community of learners, right? And how do we do that? And I'll just say, you know, hypothesis is not necessarily a magic bullet. We can edit that out of the recording later, but it's not necessarily a magic bullet um, in the sense that, you know, 
uh, I've assigned a hypothesis and now students are suddenly going to be independent thinkers, right? I think you have to do a lot of the thoughtful work that it's clear that Sue does and Bridget does in terms of like how you set up the assignments, how you prop the assignments that that, that not just the tool, but the culture of the classroom evokes, um, you know, student ownership and student authorship and things like that and, and collaboration. But the question from, Co from Colleen is, have you ever used hypothesis in synchronous, in asynchronous courses as a way to encourage collaboration among students? Um, so I'd, I'd be interested in your response to that asynchronous courses, encouraging collaboration among students um, and other ways that you encourage collaboration. And Bridget, maybe this time we can start with you. I haven't used it in an asynchronous, uh, in an asynchronous course, um, but I did use it during remote. Uh, I used OER and hypothesis uh, in uh, OER, sorry, in remote learning. Um, so generally our courses, uh, when they were online in first year writing, they were synchronous. Um, but often I use it asynchronously because I'm assigning it for uh, for out of class work. So yes, I, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I understand like the full context for the question, but uh, but I haven't used it in asynchronous course. I've used it in synchronous courses, um, but assigned uh, both in face to face and remote learning assigned things for asynchronous. Uh, assignments. So it's mostly used asynchronously because they're doing it for homework? Well, like uh, Susan said, we also use it in class. I think at least that's what I picked up, that you're actually doing annotation in class, and we do that too. Um, okay. But I would say there's a, there's a mix of using it in class and out. Gotcha. I use some of it in class, but I do use it asynchronously, as Bridget said, for assignments that they're preparing at home. I like it because it allows them to work at their best. Um, I think another factor of hypothesis and OER um, use in hypothesis is that our students really don't work on the same diurnal system that we do. My students do their best work at 10, 11, 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And hypothesis allows them to come into a text when they're at their best, where my class at seven o'clock in the morning, they're not at their best. I, I do a lot of, come on guys, wake up, whether I'm face-to-face -face in the classroom, synchronously in Zoom, there's a lot of, I'm gonna do a poll now to make sure everybody is awake and everybody is with me into mentally as well as physically. But hypothesis allows them to come into a text, to leave notes for each other, to converse in a format that, again, as a 50-something, I like having this kind of a conversation. I want to read someone's face. I want to hear the excitement in their voice. I want to see them nod their heads. But my students are used to having Twitter conversations. They're used to being in Instagram and DMing each other so that there's a lag between the conversation. And they're able to have six conversations simultaneously. Now, Hypothesis allows me to leverage that and allows me to invite them into a text and say, if you need time to think, think. Because that I think was the biggest discovery for me during the pandemic about students and conversations in general. They don't like the spotlight being on them. They like being able to step back and go, is there a better way to do this? Can I explain this? Do I have to look up how to spell this word? They're much more self-conscious and they're much harsher critics of each other than we are as instructors of them. So they're not, for lack of a better word, performing to an audience of one. They're performing to an audience of everybody in the classroom. And they're very aware of that social media judginess that we as instructors stand and go, well, this is who we are. They've never claimed that who I am without a social media kind of shadow looming over them. So hypothesis allows them that natural breathing space and allows them an ability to get comfortable with an idea before they put it out there for global consumption. 
I hope that makes sense. It makes a ton of sense. And I think it's a big part of open pedagogy, right? Is that, um, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a scholar, you have a voice, you have things to share, but not everybody's ready to do that uh, immediately. And I think it's great to create context in which they practice and they have space to, you know, inhabit that voice. And then, yeah, eventually there's more public uh, areas beyond the classroom to share that with. Um, Bridget, do you want to add one thing or? Well, yes, I mean, I think that um, this is a really important point to make um, in terms of student engagement, that if we want students to see argument as conversation, we need to have that, I think, practice. It, hypothesis gives them good practice in that. And I think students are more reluctant now than they were in my experience in, in past uh, years they're more reluctant to speak up in class, to verbally, orally in class. And I think partly that can be attributed to remote learning, students having their sort of cameras off and muted uh, during remote learning. But I think it's also based on what I've heard from students, it's also part, it's a reaction to the political culture that we're in. They see people on social media uh, get canceled, you know, and uh, yeah. and they're they're reluctant to express their views at times, um, especially orally face to face. And so, having an opportunity to compose and deliberate uh, and uh, and write, it's both serves really well the objectives of a writing course, but it also enables the students to really kind of move out of they're sort of, you know, the cone of silence that that some of them can be in. And really they, um, I've, you know, heard students say that I'm getting more comfortable. I would never express yeah. my views on a controversial issue in a social context. And I'm getting more comfortable doing that. And for and a lot of our students, this is the first time they're getting out of that echo chamber where they curate, they live in a curated community where they know they always agree with everybody. So and whatever your course is, they're sitting next to someone who it's not political, it's religious, it's just a lived experience. And they're unsure how to move through that. And that for me is where community membership comes from. And that idea that they start to identify as a member of our class or our institution, or our program, so they don't see themselves just as student, they see themselves as learner, they see themselves as writer, maybe in training, maybe an apprentice, but they don't have that kind of stigmatized view that they are school student anymore, yeah. because Absolutely. they're interacting at this different level. Yes, and just to add to that, the role of citizen, you know, this is really preparation for citizenship. Amazing place to end there. I love that connection to the wider um, public discourse. Um, I have to do a couple of housekeeping notes before I give you guys a big thank you. One, uh, some of the audience is probably customers of Hypothesis and can turn around and do the kinds of things Sue and Bridget are doing, or maybe already are. Um, we can get you on another liquid margins if you have a story to tell. Uh, some of you are not yet customers of Hypothesis, and we do have a summer boost promotion going on right now just through the end of the month. If you get in touch with education at Hypothesis before the end of the month, uh, you can get a great deal on a starter package over the summer, get uh, Hypothesis uh, accessible for everybody in your institution and a chance to really try it out, try some of the stuff that Sue and Bridget are doing and see if it works for you. Um, so please get in touch with education at Hypothesis if you are interested in, in uh, becoming a customer and, and having this experience. Uh, if you already are a customer, a couple things um, to share. Uh, we have a summer workshop series coming up on annotation starter assignments, creative ways to use social annotation, multimedia and tags in annotation, grading and feedback in annotation. So check out our website for that, although this will also be included in uh, the follow-up messaging to the group. Um, and then finally, Hypothesis Academy. Uh, this is something we launched in January. It's been a tremendous success. It's really, I mean, if you see the way that Sue and Bridget are riffing off each other and engaging with each other, and I think probably both storing each other's ideas for implementation, this is what Hypothesis Academy is. It's uh, instructors coming together, some new to Hypothesis, some veteran users, and sharing ideas, co-creating assignments. Um, it's run by Christy DeCarolis and our, um, and our customer success team. 
couldn't recommend it more. Again, this is for customers only. So, but you can check out our website or follow the links in the in the follow up email to get involved. We have three of our normal Hypothesis 101 courses running this summer. One starting in just a couple of weeks, and then we've also developed a social annotation in the age of AI. I don't know if anybody's heard about this thing called artificial intelligence or large language models or generative, um, uh, it, uh, blanking on the word all of a sudden. Um, maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you've heard of ChatGPT. We're engaging with it. We're thinking about ways to use it and also ways to teach in ways that will maybe make your students less reliant on it. Um, so please join us. And what a great conversation. Sue, Bridget, uh, you're both inspiring educators. I'm really just this is why I love doing this show is talking to folks like you and I'm having I'm going to have a great afternoon because of this conversation. So many thanks. And uh, your students are very lucky to have you. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Go forth and annotate. And I want to give you guys a plug for Hypothesis Social Annotation 101. I did the course and it was so much fun and so interesting to interact with people who didn't teach only in my discipline. The best thing about that is it gets you out to see how your faculty in other disciplines are using hypothesis and how what you do kind of trickles in. So I can't recommend that enough. I think you guys do a great thing with that. Wow. Uh, so we're just going to be slicing and dicing everything you've said today into little promotional videos for hypothesis. And that's a great one for Christy uh, to add to our, our website. And, and seriously, Sue, so much uh, thanks. Uh, just inspiring to hear how you work with your students. They're very, very lucky. Oh, Stay in thank touch. you. Okay, have a good one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.